more time. One more time, One shall more we? One more time. Oh, oh, you're welcome. We'll get a few more out of them. We'll get a few more. Uh, this feels Chris, good. Welcome, man. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, proud and, to be here. Thank you. Congratulations. You have had a ridiculous September. Let's just say this month alone you know, has you, been insane. That's the best way to put it, guys. Yeah. I mean, literally, we have been everywhere. We just, um, you know, we've been out touring with my buddy Sam Hunt. It's been an amazing uh, summer, first of all. And then September rolls around, and we started kicking off the Everybody Tour yeah. in, uh, in light of this album, which um, this just came out in stores and it's doing very well for us. We, Of course, we just uh, heard the Fix a Drink song playing. That's the first single, and first it's single, uh, yeah. my latest top ten record on uh, on the music radio. So... Man, everything seems to be going our way. The kids are good. The wife is good. good so man, man. life is good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and we'll get into we'll get into all of that in depth, man. But uh, just to run down the list, because it's easy to say, oh, it's been a crazy month. But yeah. you had the uh, the ACM honors, which yeah, sure an awesome performance there. Thank you. You had uh, the the tour fifteen and a thirty. That you guys were wrapping up, which overlapped with your new th tour. Yeah, correct. Record dropped. But the thing that I w thought was really awesome was uh, Mayor uh, Megan Barry dis declared. Everybody Day in hey, Nashville. Thank you. How cool is that, man? Yeah, What's it, it like to have a day declared? Well, first of all, it was amazing. It was amazing. So uh, September 22nd is now Everybody Day in Nashville. And uh, well, thank you. And, and you know, the, the great thing about it is when I was putting together this record, you know, I, I wasn't thinking about anything but the music. But it's interesting how music can really change lives and inspire people. It can, and also, words matter. It's, I've never really felt such a presence of words mattering so much as I did after I picked this album and after it was out. Uh, and the reason I say that is because day one, when it came out and they made it Everybody Day in Nashville, man, this album is not only for everybody, but man, it this unifies people. It brings together all walks of life in country music and all kinds of ears and people outside of country music as well. And I think that epitomizes Everybody Day too. It was a very humbling experience for me to stand up and come from where I come from. I don't, I don't come from a lot. You know, I, I was raised in a small town. I moved to Nashville. I was uh, darn near homeless for a stint. I lived in the backseat of my car for the first couple of weeks. <clears throat> yeah, and kind of crashed couches here and there, and then finally got on my way. And so to come from the bottom, in the words of Drake, and now we're here, um, <laughs> you know, you know, it, it really feels like a huge blessing. And it was really great to see all walks of life come together and celebrate Everybody Day. And to know that, um, you know, take me out of it personally, but just to know that a song and music can resonate and change lives like that and really be stamped in history, and, and especially in Nashville, that meant a lot to me. It's amazing. Uh, well, I think one of the things that really speaks to you, you mentioned that, uh, you know, you were, I hadn't realized that you were homeless for a little bit in the beginning when you it's, got out there. It's so weird, man. Like really like figuring it out, right? Yeah. And there's, and there's, there's different ways of being of, of homeless, if you will. Like, like I have to say this, I never felt like I struggled once in my life. I just, I was not raised with a trust fund and a credit card, so I didn't have anything to fall back on except yeah. music, you know. I, I was born working, and I'm part of the working class. I'm for the working class, and I say this record is by the working class. Yeah, well, and, sure. uh, and, man, so when you sleep in the back seat of a car, you just lay the, the back seat down, and then you stretch out through the trunk, and uh, you just make it happen. That's a true story, but you make it happen until you get your first apartment, and then, you know... Um, you know, your music career grows. Those specific details about laying into the truck, that's that's what provides the authenticity. I, Thank I you. know you. I um and, and that to that end, the authenticity that's kind of what makes your story so great is uh you've been paying your dues for a while, man. You've been writing music for a while, you've been yeah. working there for a great time. So I gotta imagine it is surreal to be on that journey and to have it culminate in a moment where the mayor of Nashville is saying, Today is a day for you and your record. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, yeah, man. It's sure it, 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 it certainly is. And you know, and it's and not to mention being a sophomore album, which mm. You know, it's some, you know, there's there's parts of a building blocks when you're building a career where you think, am I ever going to get my first album out? And then it finally happens. And then all of a sudden, it's like you get on this skyrocket, man, and you, you're played on the radio and you have music videos and you have all this great success going on. And then all of a sudden, you, you blink another eye and, it, and your sophomore album's out. And... Um, thank you. And so, and you know, I write all my own songs and I take a lot of pride in that. You mentioned my songwriting. Like, I, I moved to town, you know, to Nashville to be an entertainer. I got into the music business to entertain people and make people smile. And bottom line is, I had to work and learn to be a songwriter. And at this point, you know, I've, <clears throat> I'm, I'm so fortunate to say I've garnered success as a songwriter and a songwriter artist in the same regard. And so, when you have um, any kind of success in life, I don't care what job it is, man. I just, you know, you got to chalk it up to another blessing, man. And it's, it's just an amazing feeling. Well, uh, speaking of amazing feelings, you just wrapped up the 15 and a 30 tour, yeah. right? Which overlapped with the launch of your Everybody, Everybody tour, tour. Yeah. which uh, I've got to ask, how, where do you find the energy to overlap tours? I know a lot of people like to take like a little short break and then move into the next one, but I think it's amazing that you're just maintaining that momentum, like like you said, like a rocket, just well, like thank keep you. going. Thank you. Well, here's how I do it. I, so first of all, you know, 
I don't care what kind of job you have in this world, success is not easy to find. And when you find it, you have to capitalize on it every single moment of the day. And man, <clears throat> the minute that I slow down, or, or for, anybody, for instance, anybody and any job slows down, somebody slides in and takes your spot, and then all of a sudden, they have your spot, and you're a notch below, right? I don't, I don't like doing that. I like to win, and I dream big, and I win big. And that's, that's, the, that's my motivation every day. So I get up, and I think, what can I do to make this better? And, man, what can I make it better with? We do two sold-out shows to cap off the 15 to 30 tour in Nashville with Sam and Marin. And then we just hop onto the Everybody Tour, and we just keep it going. And, um, and, then, and then all of a sudden, you know, I heard Chris Stapleton say it once. He said it best. He said, our tours really never end. We just kind of keep playing. And I just, I'm that guy. Like, I naturally just keep yeah. playing. I'm going to be playing either way. And so we just put an extra tag on it and call it the Everybody Tour. Here we go. Now, I got to ask you, you tapped on it earlier, and I'm happy to hear, like, the wife and kids are doing well. Does Thank it, you. do they get to join you once in a while on the road? How do you make that work? Because how do you balance that out between Family Guy and, and the Chris Jansen that's playing every day for everybody? Well, that's a fantastic question, and uh, first of all, thank you for asking, and they are doing well. My wife is actually here today. <clears throat> My children, ironically, are not this trip, which is kind of odd, because, uh, but they've, they've all started school, and they're all different ages, and they're kind of, you know, here. you have to let kids kind of be their own person as well. I don't, you know... So if they want to travel, that's cool. If not, that's cool too. Uh, the bottom line is I take them on the road a lot. I, my wife certainly every time. You know, when Buy Me a Boat, my first really big number one song hit uh, on the previous album, I just said, look, if I'm going to do this, I'm doing it. we're doing it together. I'm not doing it without you, and that's, the, that's it. I'm not, I, I don't really care otherwise to, to go any further with it. And so I said, you're going to have to... Uh, manage me, co-manage me, whatever. You, you got to be with me, period. And and so she is, and she does. And um, that's you know a happy, a happy life for me is is having healthy kids and a healthy marriage. And um, that's that's where it all starts for me. And at, at the bottom of the line is, music is icing on the cake. Yeah. I'm gonna be writing songs and singing them either way. Uh, the <laughs> bottom line is though, you know, you got to make sure that your priorities in line before you know. It, it, I'm the kind of guy that if I'm having a bad day at home. I can't play a good show. Like, I'm that kind of emotional artist. And so I, it reflects in my songs. It reflects in the way that I perform. But uh, that's how I keep my peace about me, and, and it makes things flow pretty good. Well, let's let's get into this, Rick. Let's talk about your songs and talk about writing it. How long, because it was, it's your sophomore release. Yep. It, there's a lot of pressure, especially after the huge success of, uh, of Buy Me a Boat and all that. Uh, how long have you been working on this record? Like, well, when did, What was day one like? Well, first of all, uh, let me let me clarify. For me personally, and I say this with a humble heart, I have no pressure because, man, I love my job and I love making music. Just like you love your job, yeah. I love mine, and I love making music. I, I truly do. That's the great part about being an artist. And uh, being an artist, you can wear many different hats, and sometimes you can even like pretend to not be yourself and do something else, which yeah. is amazing. It's like acting. And so, um, this record came together fast. It came together easy i mean you know when you write all your own songs and you sing all your own songs and you believe it first then everybody else will believe you know they either will or they won't very simple right. and uh, the bottom line is when you write them you just become you just become who you are man and, and this album came together i named it everybody kind of last minute um really? yeah everybody was the second song we wrote for the album i didn't even know we were writing for me, I just thought, let's write a hit song and see where it goes. And um, that's how it happens. You write, you write song after song after song, and then when it comes time to put an album together, best songs win. Well, that's the thing. That was going to be my follow-up question is, is what does that process look like in terms of writing out the songs? It's called Everybody. Mm -hmm. There is something for everybody. So I was curious if you go into the room and you go, okay, we need like a contemporary track. We need like a solid redneck blue collar anthem. Yeah. Need, like, do you, do you have those check boxes in mind when you're writing the songs or do you just, you're just an artist and you're making music and then you look at what you've made and you go, oh, these all go great together and these are my favorite songs. Here's the album. Like how do, how do you find it? First of all, may I say, would we agree he is a great interview? I mean, this guy is, this guy asked the right question. This guy asked the right questions. First of all, thanks for that. Thank you. Man. I'm, I'm truly like it. You ask really good questions, and you do your homework, and I really appreciate that. Seriously. Um, so here's how it comes together. You pegged it correctly. That is exactly how you put together, at least that's how I put together albums. We say, do we have too much of this? Do we have too much of this? Let's chop off the fat on each side and just see what's really going to stick, right? And, um, and we, just, we basically pick the best songs out of a collection. Now, we have those blue-collar working class redneck and songs, right? That are those anthems. People have been writing, this is, about, uh, this is a very anthemic record, which I'm so thankful for because I, I pride myself in writing songs like that. However, I'm a family man, so I want to make sure that I have a nice uh, juncture with all that in there as well. And then, you know, stories about normal life because, you know, we keep saying everybody, everybody is different. And so... You 
you want to make sure that you're, you're touching in all kinds of lifestyles and that you let people, you invite everybody to be in there because guess what? There's some people who don't like traditional country music and there's some people who like really traditional country music. And so there's somebody always in between as well. And so I try to write songs across the board. Um, I, I think that attributes a lot to me as a writer. If you take, you know, I, I always tell people I wear two different hats. I wear a songwriter hat and I wear an artist hat. Now my artist hat is very... You know, it's right down the middle. I kind of stay focused on me, my name, my brand. But as a songwriter, I'm able to really open up my artistic uh, creativity, and I can write for anybody across the board. Like I've written hit songs for Tim McGraw, Low Cash, many people. Yeah, and great. thank you. And with that, and with that, in regard to that, you are able to just um, say what you want, say what you feel. Uh, for me and, and and my records, I just basically do that for myself. Put them all in a pile, play them for the team, and then the team goes, we like this one, we hate that one, we kind of like this one, we love this one. And I take the loves and likes, put them all in one pile, and put them on an album. When you're uh, writing the songs for, for the different artists, it, do you ever write one that's so great and you're, like, reluctant to hand it over? Like, oh, man, I really wish I I had no... Like, I don't know how that process works, but they reach out to you and they want you to help write a song for them. Yes. They, so they come out, they say, uh, Chris, we need a great song, we need a number one hit, uh, and we know you're the guy. So go ahead, throw something together, let me know what you got. Do you get to the end of that journey and go... Oh, damn, this would have been a great Chris Jansen song. Uh, that's a great question. The answer is no, uh, surprisingly. And here's, here's the reason why. Because when I put my mind to something, uh, for instance, I had a song, his last big single called How I'll Always Be on Tim McGraw. He specifically kind of gave me a preface of what he was looking for with a song, and I kind of, I kind of picked some nuts and bolts along the way, right? So I'm thinking I'll add a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And even though I enjoy singing this every night and saying I wrote this for Tim McGraw, <laughs> it's still a Tim McGraw song at the end of the day, and that's who I wrote it for. And um, you have to respect someone's artistry enough yeah. to do that. And and I tell you what, it takes a it takes a special kind of artist writer. I know I've shared this with my my friends who are also artists who write songs for other artists. I know it's a lot jumbled there, but um, it's... I'm following. Yeah, right. So, you know, it, it just takes a special kind of artist to do that. First of all, you have to lay down your pride, be super humble, and be able to turn your music over to somebody and let them make it their own, and trust that they're going to do a good job. Thankfully, um, all the artists who have recorded my songs as a writer have done a fantastic I was gonna say, job. You gotta, it's a pretty safe bet with the list of people you've worked yeah, with. Yeah, like, 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 like fantastic job. And so, you know, it also, at the end of the day, you know, people say... You never work a day in your life if you love your job. I really love my job, and at the end of the day, it is my job. And so, you know, part of my job is songwriting. Part of my job is being an artist. Part of my job is sitting here speaking, and, and um, you know, I, I just feel very blessed to have it. Awesome, man. Well, I, I'm wondering, too, is there, uh, uh, like, a place, like, physically, like, a place that you go to that works best for when you're writing? Because yes. I... I Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, let's let's hear about it, man. Yes, <laughs> uh, my okay. So my zone is 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 anywhere that my family is around. Number one, number two. Um, where I write, where I wrote most of this album in particular, was my back porch. I had a lot of friends over to the back porch, and but basically, we could have called this the back porch sessions. I mean, truly, because we wrote everybody there. We wrote "Fix a Drink" there in the same seat. I wrote those two songs. Um, <clears throat> we wrote we wrote everything on there on the back porch. I just like hearing. You know, we we live on a on a estate with uh, woods behind us. Okay, yeah. and so. I love hearing nature, man. I like hearing the waterfall out back. I like hearing a creek running. I like the natural things. I like a, a good cup of coffee and a cold Mountain Dew and a good cigar. And I like my friends sitting around feeling like we're at home. And I like to, I like to order up some Postmates and get some food on the back porch. And let's just pop a party, yeah. you know. And, uh, and they can drink if they want to, too. And, and, um, but I find my most inspiration at home. I'm like, I'm the biggest homebody traveler you'll ever meet. I travel the world constantly. It's all that I do, literally. Last night we were in Boston, tonight we're in New York, tomorrow we're in Tennessee, you know, and it's a great life and it's such a huge blessing, but I'm the biggest homebody, like the fall is coming around, right? And so I'm thinking, everybody's thinking, ooh, everybody album, fix a drink. I'm thinking pumpkin spice latte and a nice hoodie, <laughs> right? <laughs> Who doesn't think that? <laughs> Uh, I have to admit, there's a reason I asked that previous question, because in doing my homework, I found a story that I thought was amazing, and I wanted it to, to fact check with you. Yes. Did you, did you co-write Who's Your Farmer sitting on the back of a John Deere Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, no. Uh, by the way. That's amazing. May we say again, this guy really does a good job. Uh, there's a song on the album, guys, called Who's Your Farmer. Now, let me just say, I, can I tell you the, the, a great story of redemption here? Yeah. A great story of, of, uh, of winning big and dreaming big. Goes back to my point earlier. First of all, yes. The, the idea was inspired from the seat of a John Deere tractor, a 5,300 4x4 with a front-end loader, to be exact, and uh, pulling a six-foot uh, bush hog and an eight-foot planter. Anyway, long story short, 
it's planting season, okay, and farming time. Just a few months ago, it's planting season, and so we're kind of doing that. Now, I co-wrote the song with two guys, one named Buddy Owen and one named uh, Mitchell Oglesby. Now, Mitch, you guys got to understand, six months ago from sitting on this stage with you today, Mitch, six months ago, was, was working at Nissan Motor Group. He was putting cars together. No. Yes. He's writing songs on the side. This is a great story of dreaming big and winning big. The bottom line is, in any avenue, your job, my job, anybody in this audience job, anybody watching this, it takes one person to believe. I've always said that. It takes one person to truly believe. And the bottom line is he was putting car doors together, and I heard his songs. My wife played me some songs of his just in and out of the business. You know how nepotism works. It's like one person hands it here, and, and it just happens to get to you. I loved this guy's voice. I loved his songwriting. We became friends. Long story short, we wrote the song Redneck Life together. Yeah. Okay, he's still working at Nissan. He doesn't have a publishing deal. He's not a professional songwriter. Who's your farmer idea comes along. I'm like, well, I got to jump on this. So I, here we go. So we write the song. All of a sudden, one thing happens to another. It takes one person to believe. And I'm not patting myself on the back, but I have to give credit to my wife first on this. Um, she has a publishing company. She partnered with another big publisher, Warner Chapel Music Group. Mitch is now a full-time staff songwriter, doesn't work in the car industry anymore, writes songs for a full-time living, and uh, he won big. And, he, and he, won, he won over Who's Your Farmer, and Who's Your... Thank you. That's a great... I love that That's story. That's a great story, man. Thank you. Uh, well, I want to take that moment. We're, we're going to turn to audience in a little bit. We, yeah. we do have to take some audience questions, but I do want to pivot. I want to uh, go from, from that side, that anthemic side, that amazing side, and talk about sort of the storyteller side. Thank you. Because there are some great tracks on there. Uh, Being a Dad really stood out. And, of course, there's Thank one you. resonating now, which is going huge, uh, which is... Uh, oh, take a Drunk Girl Home. Thank you. Take a Drunk Girl Home. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so I want to talk about both of those, because I think they're both amazing songs. Fantastic. Uh, first, let's start with Being a Dad, because now that I've had the John Deere tractor story, yeah. I just have this image in my head that every one of your drinks very literally like fix a drink you were making a drink being a dad you're holding your child <laughs> like it's all very literal at this point my friends say i speak in song titles <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's i'm funny. wondering like uh where did that where did that idea come from okay so being a dad was actually an idea that was brought to me by two other songwriters and uh you know it's the oldest song on the album actually now let me say as a songwriter myself i take a lot of pride in it. i know they do as well and any songwriter will tell you they take great pride in their work why wouldn't they they played me this song. I loved everything about it, but I, I didn't love it enough to want to put my stamp of approval on it and sing it. Now, in that regard, I just said, hey, it's a great song. Thank you so much. I love it. I'm going to play it in my truck, and that's how I was going to go on about life. <laughs> One of the writers is a, is a really close friend of mine. He brought up the idea. He said, man, you know, you write songs. We write a lot of songs together. We actually co-wrote the, the song Everybody Together. He said, why don't, you, why don't you try and jump in as a writer dissect this thing, see if you can switch some things around. If it works, it works. If not, that's cool. I said, well, let's check with everybody. So we got the approval from everybody, both songwriters. It was a mutual decision. I went in, I dissected it, and just as I thought, it was going to turn out to something that I really loved, and so I recorded Being a Dad. Now, the, the great thing about it is not only are they, not only is it a true-to-life story, but, man, I, I speak about my kids very often. I have four great kids. I, was, I married into a house that was already a home with two kids in it. Now, the world would say, oh, stepkids, but I don't like that word. I think that's an incredibly rude thing to call a kid, and so I, I coined a new phrase. I call them my bonus kids, and I got, I got a hot wife and two kids bonus, and so... <laughs> It was pretty great. And so, you know, we got married and so on and so forth. We had two more little babies, very healthy, and that makes four. So, you know, I always tell people every night, man, I'm a happy husband and a happy dad, and those are the, the main focuses of my life, and music comes second. And uh, so being a dad epitomizes that. Uh, now, Drunk Girl. Yeah, let's get into that, because that song right now, it, it's an amazing song, Thank but you. it's really blown up. Like, people are really, the album's been Crazy. out since, what, like Friday officially? Yeah, just a few days. So it's a few days, <clears throat> and, and I was looking at Twitter, and people are really responding to this track. So yeah. wh why did this song uh, happen? How did it come to be? Well, thank you, first of all. And secondly, um, you know, here I am speaking about being a dad. Now, that trails right into this perfectly, because, you know, I, I co-wrote this song from a father's perspective. OK, uh, let me just to, to, to paraphrase some of the lines. Take a drunk girl home. Let her sleep all alone. Leave her keys on the counter and your number by her phone. Pick up her life. She threw across the floor. Leave the hall lights on. Walk out and lock the door. Teach her the difference between a boy and a man. Take a drunk girl home. Now, yeah. written from a father and a man's perspective, it's just good information. You can't have enough good information. You know, I heard someone earlier speaking about good information. You can't have a good enough, enough good information in the world. And I think a lot of times things get misconstrued. And you know what? Bad things happen when good information is not presented. And so writing it from a father's perspective and just from a good human perspective, man, you know, you can never go wrong doing the right thing. 
right. it's very easy. Just do the right thing. And so, exactly. And so that is the main premise behind the song. And I will tell you, it is blowing up. It's, it's, we're getting a lots of feedback. Um, and, and we're getting a lot of female feedback, which is an amazing thing. Because I can assure you, man, it means so much to me being a husband, being a father of two girls, two boys, but two two girls who I would I would hope that if they ever got into the drunk girl situation, yeah. which inevitably we have all been there, guys and girls alike, I would hope that a young man would treat her with the same kind of respect as I would, you know. And uh, so we wrote the song. It was very passionate to our hearts. We cried all the way through it. And uh, <laughs> I have to tell you, the this, this song was written from True Events, and um, I have to attribute a lot of that to my two co-writers, Tom Douglas, Scooter Caruso. They're world class. They're Hall of Fame songwriters. And... Um, I couldn't have done it without him. I wonder, about, yeah, thank, you can applaud for that. Thank, it's a great thank you song. Very much. If you haven't heard it, you got to go listen thank to you. it immediately. Thank you. Um, thank you. A few more things, because I, I don't want to leave this just yet. I'm fascinated uh, by the idea of, because your shows are known for uh, high energy. We saw in that video, you're jumping around the stage, you're having yes, a great time. Playing it's drums. A party, playing drums. Yeah, I, all the research I did, I didn't realize you were playing <laughs> drums too. Yeah. Um, so, so talk about the difference. Now you play this new song, that uh, this storyteller song, this serious song, this great message, good information. How has it been playing that live, sort of contrasted with that what you That is you're... straight whiskey. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, what's what's the vibe like in the audience? They're obviously responding to it. It's resonating with the crowd. How does that feel for you as an artist playing that song versus when you usually are, are jumping around doing these big things? This is a much more intimate scenario. Oh, absolutely. Right? Well, first of all, I love that question. And here's how I would answer that the best. First of all, I love music. It's just what I do, you know. And so I believe that, first of all, in anything that you're doing, you have to believe in yourself first or nobody else is going to believe. And when you take great passion into a song, especially like Drunk Girl, you can take it in front of a drunk audience and the audience goes and they're sobered up within one snap of a finger. The bottom line is if you write a song well enough, and I'm not saying that I did or we did. I'm just, I'll say it. but I'm, okay, thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> you did, you uh, did. But you the did. bottom line is you if, you, after this. if you write a song well enough, if you write a song well enough, you don't have to jump around and sing and play harmonica and go crazy, as I generally do. Now, I do that because the music leads me there. It's not because I'm trying to impress someone. I'm not trying to gain an extra person or make somebody go, wow, he's great. I let the music lead, and I follow wherever it goes. Generally, it leads me to jumping way in the air, playing drums like Tommy Lee and acting like a wild man. <laughs> However, when you sing a song like Drunk Girl, if you write it good enough, it will resonate on its own. The song will speak for itself, and, it, and that's, what, that's what it does live. Yeah, and I'll tell you why it's a great song. I mean, for all the obvious reasons, but uh, great message. You guys nailed Thank that. You. But it's not over the top or cheesy. It's sincere. Uh, it's clever. And even the title of the song subverts expectations. You think of a country song, you think, take a drunk girl home. You know, when I first read it, I was like, that's that's gonna okay. Let's get in. Let's see what this is. <laughs> this is what gonna go. It's gonna go one of two ways. Everybody says this that. It's gonna be. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and so I think you did a, a, an incredible job. Uh, I could keep asking you questions, but I do want to give some time for audience. Man. We're gonna turn it over, man. Thank you uh, so much. Thank you, no, dude. It's thank been you, dude. a pleasure. Absolutely, pleasure's all thank mine. You. Let's go ahead. We've got some mics in the room. First one's gonna be right here. Hi, Chris. Thank hey, how you are for you being here? Uh, what comes first for you, the song titles or the song lyrics? I love that. Uh, that's a great question. You must be a songwriter. Um, well, first of all, it's 50-50 for me. A lot of times the title will come first. And then if I can get my hands on a good title, for instance, we were talking about Who's Your Farmer earlier. My friend Mitch, he brought me this title called Who's Your Farmer, and I went, say no more. Song that's writes it. itself. Song, <laughs> songs, write, songs do write themselves sometimes. Um, titles come first, but a lot of times, you know, in, 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 in the other 50% regard, I'll be riding down the road. In fact, last night I was, I was flying into New York City last night from Boston, and I had some lyrics just kind of running through my head with a little melody, and I thought, lyrics first. I didn't even have a title for it. I'll come home a million times, and, I, and Kelly will go, how was the write today? And I'll say, it was great. What's it called? I don't know. And so, what do you mean you don't know? That's because I really, truly don't. Sometimes songs get titled after the fact, so it's, a, it's an ebb and flow. Great question. Uh, next one is going to be right here. Hi. Hey. Um, so I know you have the new album in the tour, but I was wondering, in the future, do you have any dream collaborators? Uh, that's a great question. What's your name, by the way? Alexis. Nice to meet you, Alexis. So, um, my dream collaborator, people laugh at me all the time, but I honestly, like, if it was a girl, it would be my wife, uh, but she doesn't Aww. sing or play music. Um, she manages me really good, though. That's a collaboration. That's why I'm dressed so good today, there so you go. you're welcome. And uh, <laughs> beard's looking good, I gotta say. Anyway, uh, that would be a good collaboration. That's who I would like to do if I was a woman, but um, if it was a man, like, I have to be honest with you, man, like, I would want to collaborate with somebody un unbelievable, like, like, Elton John or freaking yeah. um, 
yeah, Elton John, that would be a great collaborator. Now that I play piano live in the show, it's like <laughs> he would probably want to sing Drunk Girl with me. Why not? Right? I'm just throwing that out there. If he's just putting it out, putting it out into the universe, not, man. It's not a big deal. I'm just yeah. throwing it out there. Maybe Billy well, Joel. Who doesn't like him? Elton and Billy both watch this show. I, well, I knew. So they I did. can tell. Yeah, yeah. They're they're very big fans. I knew they so, did. So uh, I'll let that. you know. I'll yeah, let great. You know if we can. Great. Um, you just tell them to phone it right in. Just bring. Just let us know. Hit no us problem. up with a text. Uh, what I do want to ask. I do have a follow up to that though. Is that there? I've when uh, doing my uh, research, I came across a YouTube video where you did a performance uh, where you like Kid Rock were messing around on stage, yeah. and then <laughs> you dropped. You dropped a sublime verse in the middle of this like jam session, which was mm -hmm. an influence that I did not expect or anticipate. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what's like one or two other uh, influences or bands you like that we might be surprised to hear. Like, well, oh, wow, Chris well, first Chris. let me say thank you for that compliment. And uh, I'm a pretty surprising eccentric dude. You have no idea. <laughs> Literally, like I'm not even wearing underwear. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I am. Hey, oh, I am. Oh, I'm kidding too. I am, but I just wanted to see if you spit that out. And you did. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I just I know how much this cost, so I'm that's, able. To that's eccentricity. Okay. I don't even know if that's a word, but it sounds awesome. Uh, the bottom line is, I love Sublime. And if you you know if you go back to listen to Fix a Drink, my my current top ten on the radio, you will hear. Now think about this. You'll hear, I can fix a drink. It kind of is sublimish. I took the inspiration from Sublime Records yeah. because I'm a, I'm a huge fan of that. Now, what else do I love that would probably blow your mind? Bob Gruen is a, is a New York photographer, very famous rock photographer. He's a friend of mine, and we share a same passion. We both love the band The Sex Pistols, okay? I love The Sex Pistols, and I'm a huge Social Distortion fan, and uh, I listen to a lot of punk rock music. I was raised on the radio, country music radio. I was also raised a product of, of um, you know, late 80s music, early 90s music, from anywhere from Hank Williams Jr. to Guns N' Roses, which I was a huge fan of. And in a whole other lifetime, I'll tell you another interview. I wrote my first five songs with Guns N' Roses, but that's a that's a other true story. Bottom line is, wait, I have, wait, wait. Yeah, okay, let's go, <laughs> let's let's go ahead and talk about it. Hang on. Yeah, no, I got the time I to got, hear the Guns N' Roses story. I've got the course. time to tell you. So, well, I got my first publishing deal after that homeless stint and my Tootsie's Bar gig stint in Nashville. I was played there for one year in the bar scene. I finally got, I've got a publishing deal first. And a publishing deal is what my buddy Mitch got. He got signed as a professional songwriter. That's how you get paid. You have a nine to five songwriting job and you do it all day, every day, and you try to be the best you can. I got my first publishing deal as a kid. It, it, I thought I was super rich. I was super poor. And they were like, have you ever been to Los Angeles? I was like, no, but I want to go. And I'd never been on an airplane before. So I got on an air, this is so wild. I got on an airplane for the first time and went to Los Angeles, California. And I was writing for an LA public and I, they were like, who are your influences? I was like, well, duh, uh, Johnny Cash and Guns N' Roses. And they said, well, we publish a band called Velvet Revolver. And, uh, and I went, holy kadoodle. <laughs> And, uh, the so, only natural response. No, well, <laughs> what else would it say? Yeah, and so say. we that's get to L.A., and I start a residency of songwriting with Duff McKagan from, from Velvet Revolver, who actually just rekindled our, our, our relationship uh, acquaintance. We played the Greek Theater in L.A. a few weeks ago. He was, unfortunately, not for the people watching the tour, but unfortunately he was out of town when I asked him to come join me. And uh, he's back with GNR, of course, as everybody knows. But the bottom line is we wrote four or five songs. Izzy Stradlin joined us for a couple songs. It was really an amazing moment in time. And, and, and to talk about ex like, like ex the eccentric side of me, I ha at 31 years old, I have seen so much of life that it's not even funny. And I have witnessed almost every side and style of music and hung with everybody from all different genres. And I think that attributes exact, precisely. It truly does attribute to who I am with this album, everybody. And, and, and I wasn't, you know, ironically, I wasn't even going to bring it back to that, but it kind of made sense. I'm just doing my job. Well, it, it makes good, it, it just makes good TV. <laughs> I'm, that's all it is, right? And so, uh, and so, hey, here's the bottom line. You know, it, it, all those things encompass who I am. I am a rock guy. I am a punk rock guy. I am a super country redneck guy, if you need me to be. And I'm also the, the guy who can sit down at a piano and, and play drunk girl and, uh, and be the Leonard Cohen type, if you need me to be as well. And so all those things fully encompass who I am. It's who I am when I walk around every day. It's who I am when I play music. And it's who I am certainly when I write songs. Pretty awesome. Um, thank you. Thank you for that show story, for sharing that. Yeah, we have time, you. I believe, for one last question. Bring it. Right here. Hi, Chris. Hey. Um, so I'll admit, I didn't start loving country music until I went to college in the South. Mm -hmm. So what is it about country music that you love? What's your name? Haley. Haley. Where'd you go to college? West Virginia. You're a WVU student? I am. You ever heard of the Davison Brothers? The day, if you watch the Fix a Drink video, the Davison brothers are in a cameo star in the video with Luke Bryan, Michael Ray, Dustin Lynch, and Lokash. No name dropping, but it's true. <laughs> and <laughs> 
My wife smokes a cigar in that video too. But anyway, I can't believe you went to WVU. Unbelievable. Okay, my, there's a place there called Schmidt Saloon. Short story. One of my favorite places. Okay, great. My band, a huge sign that says Chris Jansen basically started here is out in front of there. Okay, long story short. Now, do I, what was your original question? What do you love about country music? Oh God, well I love you and uh, I love that you went to West Virginia and also about country music. Man, you know, a lot of people will tell you straight up, I love the fans, but I love more than just the fans. I love the vibe of it. I love the historical significance of it. I am not an Opry member, but I have played it almost more than any new artist in the history of the Grand Ole Opry. I love the heritage of country music. I love the Ryman Auditorium, the Grand Ole Opry. I love touring. I still think it's cool to get on a tour bus and ride around the country, get on a plane and fly to shows. Like, I love everything about it because at the end of the day, uh, fame, no fame, on or off, any kind of camera, on and off the radio, I'd be doing it either way. So I've always done it either way. I, I'll be honest with you, the reason I like it so much is because I finally found something that I was worth a at. And, um, it's the internet, you could say anything no, it, you want. Okay, worth a shit at. And uh, <laughs> the, bottom line, the bottom line is, man, you know, I can, do, I can do a lot of things subpar, but I can do um, music pretty decent, and country music is where my heart is. Well, that's the understatement of the year. Pretty yeah. decent, huh? Well, well I'll, you. I'll, you know what? I'll be the one to say it. You do it more than just pretty decent, my friend. You're outstanding at it. Thank this you. record, uh, guys, everybody, it came out Friday. It's out now. Get it. There's no reason not to get it. It's a great listen. Thank you. You got so much in front of you. Congratulations and everything. One more Thank time. Chris much. Jansen, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.